Welcome to session four of The Heart of Holiness, Finding Peace in the Love of God. Today we'll be moving on to the third key of Undebound, which is renunciation. First, we'll be looking a little deeper at the role of emotions in our Christian morality, and then we'll be talking about what renunciation is and how it can help us to grow in peace. It's true that Christianity is not about thinking or doing whatever we feel like, but our feelings, as we'll see, actually play an absolutely essential role in following the teachings of Jesus. Jesus wants our feelings to be both reasonable and charitable. God created the world with a certain moral order, which means that certain actions are morally right and certain actions are morally wrong. And when God created us, he created each of us with a conscience, which is a judgment of reason by which we are able to determine whether a particular action is morally right or wrong. Even on our own, we are generally able to figure out that murder is wrong, that theft is wrong, that lying is wrong, and even that there is a God to whom we owe worship. Because of our fallen human nature, though, we are often incorrect in the judgments of our conscience. We might decide, for example, that it's okay to steal, even though we should know in our hearts that stealing is wrong. We might decide that it's okay, either because we've seen other people doing it, or because we really want to and we convince ourselves, we rationalize ourselves into thinking that it's okay. Because our consciences are easily misguided, God chose to reveal to us certain basic moral principles, especially in the Ten Commandments. St. Augustine explains why God gave us these Ten Commandments on tablets of stone. He says, God wrote on the tables of the law, what men did not read in their hearts. When God became man in Jesus Christ, though, he made it clear that it wasn't enough just to follow the Ten Commandments. Especially in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapters 5 through 7, especially in the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus calls us not only to change our actions, but to change our hearts, which includes our feelings our emotions, our passions, our affections. Jesus didn't just say, you shall not kill, but he warned, whoever is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. He didn't just say, you shall not commit adultery, but he warned, everyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. He didn't just say, love your love your neighbor and hate your enemy, he said, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Jesus even went so far as to say, so be perfect, just as your heavenly Father is perfect. In this series, we've been talking about how we as humans are weak and prone to sin. So what kind of perfection could Jesus possibly expect from us? The Second Vatican Council explained All Christians in any state or walk of life are called to the fullness of Christian life and to the perfection of charity. Jesus calls us to love the Lord with our whole heart and to love our neighbor as ourselves. This is charity. This is the perfection towards which we are called. This is the measure of our holiness. As we've already seen, this is not possible on our own strength, but by the strength of the Holy Spirit who has been given to us, with whom we must learn to cooperate. The Catechism explains that in order for our charity to be perfect, we have to love God not only with our will, but with our passions, with our whole heart. We are morally responsible for our passions like joy, sorrow, desire, fear, anger, hatred, only to the extent that we consent to them with our will. We are constantly experiencing feelings, these movements of the heart, like joy, hope, sorrow, fear. Those feelings may come from ourselves, they may come from the devil, or they may come from God. God himself can inspire passions within us, and the devil can also tempt us to passions. 
And of course, feelings can come from our own hearts. So suppose a particular passion or feeling arises within you. You are not morally responsible for that feeling unless you choose to think, to speak, or to act based on that feeling, or if you choose to continue to feel or not to feel that particular feeling. The more often we choose to think, speak, and do what is good, the more we build good habits, which we call virtues. God wants to give us true freedom and virtue, while the devil and his demons want to enslave us in vice. Today, when we use the word freedom, it usually means that no one is telling us what to do. We consider ourselves free if we are allowed to do whatever we want to do, because we think that happiness is found in doing whatever we feel like. Historically, Christians have understood freedom very differently. Freedom is not a lack of exterior restraint so that we can do whatever we want. Freedom is a lack of interior restraint so that we can more easily do what we know we should. True peace comes when all of our emotions are rooted in charity, which is loving God above all things, loving our neighbor as ourselves out of love for God, and when all of our emotions are directed toward loving God and loving other people even more. And this is not something that happens overnight, but God does gradually want to help us to gain control of our passions rather than being controlled by our passions. St. John of the Cross put it this way. He said, The entire matter of reaching union with God consists in purging the will of its appetites and emotions so that from a human and lowly will it may be changed into the divine will, made identical with the will of God. When these emotions go unbridled, they are the source of all vices and imperfections. But when they are put in order and calmed, they give rise to all of the virtues. So peace grows within us when we both choose to do everything out of charity and eventually when we are in the habit, the virtue of feeling like doing everything out of charity. Peace comes when we both choose and feel like loving God. The goal is for our hearts to be like the heart of Jesus, to desire only that God's will would be done, to fear only that God's will would not be done, to rejoice only when God's will has been done, to be sorrowful or angry only when God's will has not been done, and to hate only sin, which is the opposite of God's will. This may seem inhuman and unnatural, and in a sense it is. It's not human, it's divine. It's not natural, it's supernatural. So God himself gives us supernatural virtues to guide us in this inner battle. The virtues of faith, hope, and charity are the theological virtues, virtues that God himself infuses within us through the Holy Spirit, particularly in the sacrament of baptism. Faith, hope, and charity set our hearts on God so that we seek our happiness and our peace, not in ourselves, but in him. By faith, we commit ourselves to God and to all that he has revealed to us through Jesus Christ and his church. By hope, we long for communion with God, both now and in eternity. By charity, we love God above all things, and we love our neighbor as ourselves out of love for him. If we finish this life with our will securely within faith, hope, and charity, then our hearts are in communion with God and we'll have eternal life with him. It's really that simple. But if, on the other hand, we allow our will to leave faith, hope, and charity through what we call mortal sin, then by our own decision, we're separated from God. Again, it's that simple. I'm going to give an analogy here that's imperfect and incomplete, but I think it's helpful nonetheless. Imagine faith, hope, and charity as the walls of a tall, impenetrable fortress within the innermost part of our soul, a fortress that guards the life of grace that God has given us in baptism. Especially in the beginnings of the spiritual life, our passions 
often wander outside of the Father's will, outside of this fortress. But our will can still stay firmly rooted in God's will. So long as our will is inside this fortress, doesn't leave God's will, we are completely secure from the attacks of the enemy, the devil. As creepy as it sounds, the devil's real, and he has a plan for your eternal destruction. He's like a military commander in battle, looking for your greatest weakness, so that he can draw your will out of communion with God's will. It's important to know the devil's limitations in this battle. The devil can tell you lies, but he cannot read your thoughts. He cannot see into the depths of your heart. He can stir up your passions, but the devil can never move your will. The devil can fight from outside your heart, just on the periphery of your heart, but he has absolutely no access to the innermost part of your heart where God dwells. So the devil's most basic tactic is to shoot his deadly arrows, temptations, through our senses and imagination in order to stir up our passions into battle. He wants to get us to fight for anything other than God's will. First, he draws out our passions from this fortress of God's will so that we are fighting for something else. And ultimately, he wants to get us to move our will outside of God's will, to make something else more important than God. Most of us have heard of the seven deadly sins or the seven capital vices. These are seven bad habits from which all other bad habits flow. These vices are our own bad habits. We ourselves create them by our decisions over and over again to sin. But according to Catholic tradition, there are literally demons associated with each of these vices. Demons who are responsible for stirring these vices up within us. So sometimes, without realizing it, we really do spiritual battle with these spiritual enemies. Each of these evil spirits incites us to fight for something other than communion with God, something other than God's will. They say something like, Come over here. Something more important than God is under threat. You should really be guarding this, fighting for this, instead of worrying about God's will. The demons stir up our passions into battle first so that we love something other than God, so that we fear losing something other than God, so that we desire something other than God, so that we are angry about having lost something other than God or sad about having lost something other than God, so that we rejoice in something other than God. And these passions tempt our will to leave the security of God's will. Let's take a look at each of these seven deadly sins to see how they tempt us. Pride or vainglory is a desire to be praised by others, which tempts us to fight for attention from others instead of fighting for God's will. Envy is a sadness over others' blessings, which tempts us to fight to bring other people down instead of fighting for God's will. Wrath is an irrational anger which causes us to fight for revenge instead of fighting for God's will. Sloth is boredom or sadness of the things of God, which tempts us to simply leave God's will in hopes of finding something better. Greed is an excessive desire for wealth, which tempts us to fight to fill our wallets instead of fighting for God's will. Gluttony is an excessive desire for food or drink, which tempts us to fight to fill our bellies instead of fighting for God's will. And lust is a disordered sexual desire, which tempts us to fight for physical gratification instead of fighting for God's will. Each of these seven deadly vices or sins is simply a diversion tactic of the devil to get us to set our hearts on something other than communion with God, first by drawing our passions to fight for that thing, and then 
if the devil is successful, getting our will to leave God's will in pursuit of that thing. The good news, though, is that we can find peace by renouncing lies and sinful passions and evil spirits. Whenever we realize that we've committed a mortal sin, which means that we've deliberately and intentionally done something that is seriously outside of God's will, if we go to confession, that's enough to get us safely back in communion with God. Quite often, though, we find ourselves going to confession over and over again, confessing the same sins. On the one hand, we shouldn't be discouraged about this, because this is a lifelong battle. And if we're sincere each time we go to confession, we can trust that God really has forgiven us every single time, and that every single time he's going to give us strength to resist the new temptations that will come. But on the other hand, if we keep falling into the same serious sins, or if we find ourselves compulsively falling into a particular sin over and over again, there's reason to believe that some deeper renunciation might be necessary. Renunciation means saying no to something, refusing to leave any room in your life for something. If we can identify the lie that keeps pulling us away from God and renounce that lie, we can break the power of that lie, whether that lie is from the devil or from our own misperceptions. If we can identify any spirit that might be at work, which definitely involves some guesswork, and we can renounce that spirit, we can break its power. Ultimately, renunciation is about saying no to any lie, to any spirit, to any passion that draws us away from the security of God's will and the peace of God. Saying no to a particular passion may not feel peaceful, but it's the only way to true peace. It's no coincidence that the cross is the symbol of Christianity not only because Jesus himself died on the cross, but because he calls every single one of us to die to ourselves, that is, to our disordered passions, renouncing any desire that keeps us from following God's perfect desire. St. Paul says, Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified their flesh with its passions and desires. This is usually a gradual process. First, our passions chase after all sorts of things that are far from God's will. And our will will still tend to follow those passions outside of God's will pretty frequently. And we have to train our will to remain within the fortress of faith, hope, and charity. And then we teach our passions to leave behind some of those things that are quite so far from God and our passions wander a little closer to God's will and our will remains pretty securely inside of God's will. But then even our passions learn to come inside of God's will and we learn to rejoice in the Lord and we learn to be sorrowful for our sins. And we learn to desire to be united more fully with the Lord and to fear only that we might be separated from him. Our passions start to line up with our decision to be with God. And that's when we experience peace. And the only way to this peace is through renunciation. The Catechism of the Catholic Church says, the way of perfection passes by way of the cross. There is no holiness without renunciation and spiritual battle. Spiritual progress entails the ascesis and mortification that gradually leads to living in the peace and joy of the Beatitudes. Ascesis and mortification mean self-discipline and self-denial, and they are essential to growing in holiness 
as we learn to realize that communion with God is the only thing worth fighting for, the only real treasure. Think of the vows of our baptism, which we renew every Easter. The priest asks, Do you renounce sin so as to live in the freedom of the children of God? And we respond, I do. The priest asks, Do you renounce the lure of evil so that sin may have no mastery over you? We respond, I do. And the priest says, Do you renounce Satan, the author and prince of sin? And we respond, I do. Saying no to anything that keeps us from communion with God and growth in holiness is absolutely essential. Think of the story of the rich young man in the Gospels. He approaches Jesus and asks, Teacher, what good must I do to gain eternal life? First, Jesus talks about the importance of keeping the commandments. And this rich young man says, I've kept all the commandments since I was a kid. And then Jesus says, If you wish to be perfect, go sell what you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. When the young man heard this statement, he went away sad, for he had many possessions. Selling everything that you own is not a requirement to live a Christian life. But Jesus saw this young man's heart. He saw that his passions and perhaps even his will were more set on riches than on God himself. And so he proposed this challenge to sell everything that he owned. God calls very few of us to literally sell everything that we own. But there may be quite a few of us who need to renounce greed, or renounce a desire for wealth, or renounce selfishness, or renounce the lie that money can make us happier than God can, or perhaps renounce some insecurity that drives us to seek fulfillment in wealth rather than in God. All of us can ask ourselves, do I have any recurring passions or feelings that keep pulling my will away from God's will? And what are those passions fighting for? Why do my passions keep going back to that? Do I believe some lie about myself, some lie about the world around me, or some lie about God that is luring me to seek security outside of God's will? In an unbound session, after the interviewer has listened to you and talked through your story for quite some time, He or she will then walk you through the five keys. First, you will be encouraged to make a prayer of faith and repentance. Then you'll be encouraged to forgive anyone who may need to be forgiven. And third, in the name of Jesus, you'll be encouraged to renounce any lies or spirits that you suspect are at work in your life. Quite often, great freedom is found in becoming aware of our enemies and renouncing them. I encourage you to read the book Unbound by Neil Lozano in order to hear many stories about how an unbound session works. But I want to share just one snippet from my own experience with Unbound. Five years ago when I went to the Unbound conference in Towson, towards the end of the conference I had the opportunity to sit down with an interviewer and two intercessors I shared my story, I shared some of the things that I was struggling with, but by that point, I felt pretty secure in my relationship with Christ. I made a profession of faith, I forgave a few people, and I renounced a few things, but then the interviewer said, what about timidity? And at first I thought, why would I need to renounce timidity? I'm not timid. I'm just really humble and proud of it. But following this suggestion, I said, in the name of Jesus, I renounce timidity. And I can't say I felt any fireworks at that moment or even in the rest of that session, although I did experience a sense of peace. But in the weeks that followed, the Lord began to shed some light in my heart in places that I hadn't really seen before. By disposition, I'm an introvert. 
If you know me, you know that's true. But I began to realize that I was also afraid to let people see my weaknesses. Humility is about not overestimating our strengths or showing our strengths unnecessarily. But I instead was very guarded about letting other people see my weaknesses, which of course prevented me from taking risks that might expose my weaknesses. In the coming weeks and months, every once in a while, I would notice this little voice in my heart that said, I'm afraid. And immediately I would say either out loud or if necessary in my head, in the name of Jesus, I renounce timidity. Or in the name of Jesus, I renounce the fear of embarrassment. I've always been shy and socially awkward, but I think that over the past few years, I've learned to be a little more confident, but I'm still socially awkward. Sorry. I encourage you to ask yourself, though, what do I need to renounce in order to follow Jesus more fully, in order to love him more wholeheartedly? Once again, if you think that you may be called to participate in an Unbound session, I encourage you to pick up a copy of Neil Lozano's book, Unbound, from Heavenly Presence in Leonardtown, and read at least the first seven chapters before sitting down with our healing ministry. I look forward to being with you next time when we will talk about authority, which is the next key of Unbound ministry.